on today's show. The Hawks go to Sacramento and lose to begin this two-game road trip to Northern California. It was a tale of two halves in a lot of ways. The first half, rough stuff in terms of shot making. Second half, much better, but not quite enough to overcome a big deficit at halftime. We'll get into all of what unfolded in this game and much more, and all of that is on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1636 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland. Coming to you deep into the night here on a Monday evening into Tuesday. And today's show is brought to you by the folks at FanDuel. And right now, if you're a new customer, you get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet at FanDuel. And the place to go is FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Also, I should encourage you at the top of the podcast to make us your first listen each and every day. Please subscribe to the podcast. Check us out anywhere you get your podcasts. On the audio side, places like Spotify or Apple or Overcast. Also on the video side, we are on YouTube with each and every episode. And today's podcast will dive into what became a 122 to 107 loss for the Hawks up in Sacramento. This bizarre two-game trip to Northern California that is just not the norm in the NBA world. I don't want to dwell on that too much, but it's very weird. Anyway, this is the second straight loss for the Hawks. And uh, the first half, essentially, there was this bizarre brutal shooting drought from the Hawks. We'll, we'll talk about more in this game that led to the Hawks being down by 17 at the half. And they won the second half of this game, but th that hole was just too big to overcome. They got it within seven in the second half, just not quite enough to get all the way over a hump. And if you missed it over the weekend, by the way, Trey Young was diagnosed with a concussion after he took a shot. We'll try to draw a charge in the fourth quarter against the Cavs on Saturday. He was placed in the concussion protocol and did not make the trip to California with the team. Um, so that left the Hawks down two of their top six or seven guys with DeAndre Hunter already out. Clearly, the Hawks were shorthanded as a result, and the Kings were basically at full health in this game. Our friends at FanDuel made the Hawks eight and a half point underdogs, given that the, Haw that the Kings had both the health advantage and also a very big rest advantage. It was not quite as um, lopsided rest wise as the game was on Saturday, but the Kings have been off for a few days. They've been at home for even longer than that. The Hawks had a, a bad turnaround. So it was a rough spot. On paper and we'll get into it more later on but essentially the hawks could not make a shot in the first half and i want to overstate it but they posted unbelievably bad shooting numbers before halftime and that dragged down the entire offensive production for the game and that left the hawks kind of you know searching in this one they got to 107 points they only had 40 in the first half so they actually let the scoreboard a lot after halftime but it wasn't enough at any point um for the full game i would say you know still the offensive side of the floor was the worst side even if the second half was pretty good they shot 39% from the field in this one, which is bad. It's not insanely bad, but when I tell you this, it actually looks crazier. So after halftime, so second half of this game, the Hawks shot 56% from the field and 52% from three. Those are excellent numbers. And they, again, shot 39% from the floor and 35% from three in the full game. So that kind of tells you how bad the first half numbers were. It was unsightly. And I said at the time, I'll probably say it later on in the podcast, the shot quality in this game was much better than the actual shot um, efficiency, shot accuracy. But um, in the NBA, it's make or miss league. I know it's a kind of an overused term, but it really was the case in that first half. Um, anyway, a 104 offensive rating in the game for the Hawks, and it's going to be hard for the Hawks to win with that number. Um, you know, it, That's just kind of the pure, simple version of this. Um, it was, again, a, a tale of two halves. The Hawks lost by 15 points. It was basically all the shooting disparity compared to what the Kings did. Atlanta had pretty good supporting numbers in this game. 12 turnovers is very solid. They won the glass in this one. They got to the line 27 times. That's very good. DeJounte Murray was very good. Probably one of, one of his better games of the season, honestly, for the Hawks offensively. 35 points and 10 rebounds for DeJounte. He was efficient. He made shots. Um, you know, other than that, though, the shots just didn't fall in the first half, and they were down too many points to kind of overcome that after the second half kind of got underway. Um, defensively, is actually a little bit worse after halftime than it was in the first half. But they gave up a, about a 118 defensive rating in this one, which is not good. But against the Kings, who are good offensively, that's not a disaster. Honestly, I thought the Hawks were pretty fortunate at times defensively. Um, the Kings did not shoot well around the rim compared to their normal baseline. They missed a lot of bunnies that they usually make, I would say. Also, their two stars, De'Aaron Fox and Demonis Sabonis, combined to shoot 9 of 26 from the field in this one. 
that's a good baseline. If the Hawks, if I knew that before the game, I would have liked the Hawks' chances a decent amount. But unfortunately, they couldn't stop Harrison Barnes. I guess that's the real sentence I just said in 2024. Barnes had 32 points on 20 shots in the field. He was blowing by Sadiq Bay in particular. He was not just not just Bay, but certainly uh, a lot of Bay. Also, they had trouble against Malik Monk off the bench, who's a very good offensive player. So the Kings are still on, on offense very good. But, you know, Fox being this off, and he was not good in this game by his standards, to give up that kind of stuff against uh, a, a De'Aaron Fox struggling Kings team was a little bit was a little bit brutal, I would say. Um, I didn't think the defense was terrible late in the game, and we'll probably get into this a little bit at some point, I would imagine. But they allowed a metric ton of, of free throw attempts in the fourth quarter. This game... I don't want to dwell on it too much. It's not what I do on this podcast for the most part, but I thought the fourth quarter officiating wasn't necessarily one-sided, but it was certainly uh, whistle-happy. There was just a lot of whistles, lots of free throws, lots of stoppages in that fourth quarter, which might have benefited the Hawks if it broke sort of a different way, but it didn't. And in general, it was kind of just unsightly for the most part. And look, given how bad the outlier shooting was in this game in the first half and with the Hawks playing without Trey Young on the road in a bad situational spot, I thought they actually played reasonably well in this one. You throw in Murray, Murray playing well, the shot quality being kind of underperformed in this one. Defensively, they were pretty solid at times. They played good zone defense at one point in the second half, etc. I thought they gave a pretty spirited, valiant effort in the second half, like to not roll over and quit talks about that after the game as well. Being down 17, having 40 points in the first half, they could have uh, mailed it in, honestly. Um, But once they kind of had a run, they were alive and in this game all the way to the end. So it was a tough spot. And look, when you're eight and a half point underdogs, that was the actually tied for the biggest underdog the Hawks have been all year long in in terms of the betting markets. You're kind of, quote unquote, supposed to lose that game. But they just didn't have an all-time terrible shooting half. They've been right in the game. So, um, you know, it's one of 82. I always say that, but it is true. The Hawks are now 18-25 on the season. No one's happy about that. There are questions that should be asked and should be talked about that I talked about a little bit already about, like, what the goals are, short-term, long-term, because, look, the Hawks are still in the middle of the play-in race. There's not like they're, uh, the door is closed. In fact, as I record this podcast at, you know, 1 plus a.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, they are currently the 10 seed in the East. So it's like the season is over, but it's like, what do you want to get out of the season is a real question to ask, you know, Trey's out right now, but you know, beyond that, the deadline stuff, the trade stuff, et cetera, we'll talk about a little bit later on in the podcast. Um, those are real questions and reasonable ones. But as far as the game is concerned today, they played okay. They really did. They just didn't shoot the ball well at all. I mean, that second quarter was gross. We'll talk about that more in a second, but um, yeah, that's kind of the big picture. We'll drill down. If you're newest to the podcast, that's catching up on this game, having probably missed it because it was late night. First of all, I appreciate you listening, but second of all, we'll be getting into kind of how this game unfolded when it comes to the ebbs and flows in a second. Also, later on in the podcast, a look at the players who appeared in this one for Atlanta, and there were nine guys who took the floor for the Hawks in this game. At the very end of the podcast, probably some trade stuff as well. A little bit of an update, a short one probably, on the trade rumor mill right now as the deadline is, you know, two and a half weeks away at this point. But before we get to all of that stuff and more, it were from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, and the NFL playoffs are ongoing right now, and there's time to get on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And right now, if you are a new customer with FanDuel, get 150 bonus bets, guaranteed when you place a $5 bet at FanDuel. That's 150 bucks in your pocket, bonus bets, win or lose. And the FanDuel Sportsbook app is so easy to use, and there's so many different ways to bet at FanDuel. They have live same-game parlays. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, and the best, and that's, of course, the best way to find popular parlays that are already in the mix at FanDuel. Also find bets in the new Explore tab, at FanDuel, and they have all the old standards as well. Point spreads, over-unders, money lines, player props, futures, and much more. The app is safe, it's secure, they cover the entire range of sports that you're looking for at FanDuel. They have the NFL, NBA, college football, college basketball, MLB, WNBA, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, boxing, MMA. It's all there for you at FanDuel, and they have all the Hawks that you're looking for as well. They, of course, have game odds. Every single, every single time the Hawks play, they're uh, listing those in terms of the point spreads and over-unders, but also player award stuff, future bets, and much more. And now is an awesome time to set up with the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. And the place to go is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup with FanDuel. One more time, it's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel pitch partner of the NFL. All right, and I teased it, but the first half was uh, truly all about poor shot making. Like, it's, I don't want to oversimplify it. Most NBA games have lots of nuance to them. I try to emphasize the nuance on this podcast, give you the entire all-encompassing view 
sometimes to the uh, frustration of fans that want a little bit more uh, takery, but I-, I like to give you the whole picture on this podcast. But it really was, very simply, the Hawks just missing a ton of shots in the first half. There was a 10-1 run by the by the Kings after, uh, actually, City Bay made a shot for the first time since Friday, which was nice to see early on. But the defense was letting the Kings get downhill a little bit. I, I mentioned Harrison Barnes before, but he got he got downhill beyond Bay a few times in the early going. I thought DeJounte, though, found his footing in the first quarter. He had seven straight points for the Hawks. Mid-quarter kind of stabilized things a little bit. Rotationally, it was the same nine guys who appeared on Friday without Trey Young appeared in this game. It was, of course, a Kongwu off the bench. Bogey started in place of Trey, as he has in all four times that Trey has missed a game this year. Plus, Garrison Matthews, Patty Mills, and a little bit of Trent Forrest along the way. No surprises there. Um, I will say this. Uh, people kept asking about Kobe Bufkin. Lauren Williams of the AJC asked about Kobe not going on the trip. Quinn gave a pretty nondescript answer that you can read from Lauren. Uh, but it's one of those things where he talked about kind of, um, you know, him, wanting him in College Park and playing and being comfortable with that. So he actually praised Patty Mills and Trent Forrest. It was unsatisfying. I'm on record. I'll say it again now. I would be playing Kobe Buckin at this point in time. I understood him not playing for a while because I don't want to oversell it, but him missing a month plus of his rookie year early on with that thumb injury is a big setback for any young guy, any rookie. That's a uh, situation where it was like understandable that he wasn't playing. But now that he's been back on the court for a while, playing big, big, big minutes in College Park, and with Trey out and with the other situations going on in the Hawks backcourt with, you know, I'm obviously uh, high on Trent and, you know, Patty's fine, but I'd be trying Kobe and they're not doing that. So I don't, I don't love that move, but there you go. Um, they were down three of them in the first quarter, which actually felt like a gift to me. The Hawks were shooting 20% from the field, but they did a good job elsewhere in, in the possession battle, kind of getting rebounds, got to the line 10 times, one turnover in that first quarter. Uh, but things really kind of peaked in the second and peaked in a bad way, I should say. The Kings scored the first nine points of the second to go by 12. The Hawks missed their first seven shots. At that point, they were seven of 32 from the field. So, uh, you know, that speaks for itself. They got some decent looks. I thought actually moved the ball pretty well. A lot of good passing at times with the second unit, but a lot of passed up shots as well. I thought they played a little bit too slow, I thought, as well. Um, you know, it's harder without a guy like Trey to push tempo. Uh, even DeJounte, when DeJounte was, was off the floor in this game, it was kind of a ground to the halt in a lot of ways. But I think when you play a small lineup like, like the Hawks are, especially with, the, with with Capella off the floor, and you're having offensive issues, playing faster could be a little bit helpful. They just were not doing that at that point. They were down 16 by the middle of the, of the second quarter. They actually tried the two-big lineup at one point. It helped the defense and did not help the offense, as you might expect. Anytime you play Capella and Congo together, the baseline projection should be better defense, worse offense. That kind of happened in this one. Fortunately for the Hawks, nobody could score late in the first half. Um, in fact, no field goals by either team for about three minutes late in the half. The Hawks only scored one point in about four and a half minutes. Finally, that was broken by, by free throws. They scored five points in the final 524 of the second quarter and 16 points in the entire second quarter. That is not Hawks basketball in a lot of ways. And uh, here's some ugly numbers for you going into halftime. Of course, they're down 17 points. They had a 78 offensive rating in the first half. So if you don't know what that means, that means the Hawks scored 0.78 points per possession. So they were grinding it out. Just for reference, the worst offense in the league this year is like 105, something like that. Like, that's it's really bad. They shot 24% from the field in the first half. 3 of 19 from 3. Uh, Jalen Johnson had the worst shooting half of his career. He was 1 of 11. The bench combined was 1 of 9. So if you go Jalen plus bench, they were 2 of 20 combined. There was not a single player on the Hawks' active roster that shot better than 40% in the first half. And that guy was Sadiq Bey, who was 2 of 5, which is ironic because Sadiq's actually in the middle of the worst shooting slump on the team right now. And he was actually the guy who made the most percentage of their shots in that first half at 2 of 5. Again, I don't want to overstate it too much, but the shot quality was way better than the actual numbers indicate. In fact, Sanjay Lumpkin, who was one of the Hawks assistant coaches, did the interview on during halftime with Bally, and he kind of said the same thing. Like, he was kind of almost laughing, like, look, the shots are good. Like, they're getting good shots. If you watch the tape back, and I have now, watch the whole thing again for a second time, a lot of good looks in that first half. They just didn't go in, and um, ironically, it's, like, hard to do this, but the Hawks did the following in the first half. They won the rebounding battle. They won the turnover margin, and they won the free throw battle. So those are all really good things. If you do all those things, you are in great shape in the NBA. And the Hawks were down by 17 points <laughs> after one half. It's honestly, like, again, hard to do that. It's because you just shot the ball that terribly, and it did happen. 
And honestly, again, it could have been worse. The Kings missed some shots at the rim. Um, you know, it is what it is. After halftime, it was better in general. Like I said before, the Hawks won the second half of this game by two points. They were in the game all the way around. But that didn't really start till after the initial push by Sacramento. In fact, it was a 9-2 run by the Kings in the third quarter to open things up and put the Hawks down by 24 points. Had that not happened, they would have been even closer to being in the game because they had their biggest run of the night, 16-2 for the Hawks, to get the lead down from 24 down to 10. That was the first time in the game the Hawks had struck anything together in terms of like multiple possessions going in the right direction. Capella had a nice tip in, and then Stonewall a bonus for a nice stop. Um, Bogey had a bucket, Jalen hit a three. After that, they had a great possession offensively where they actually had like seven or eight good crisp passes to set up a Murray three up top of the key. Jalen Johnson came alive attacking the rim. Like it was a lot of good stuff. They played some zone in that stretch defensively that was actually pretty effective for a few minutes. Um, later in the corner, DeJounte had a four-point play. Um, the Hawks made seven of ten shots at one point, which felt like a great thing. Um, Garrison drew a charge. Like there, was, there was a lot of things going on in a positive direction in that third quarter. Unfortunately, they gave a lot of that back. In the last three minutes or so, the Kings got sort of their foundation back. And it was after the Hawks had cut it to 10 a few times, it was back to 18 at the end of the third quarter, despite the fact that they shot pretty well. Um, one more kind of big haymaker run. The Hawks had an 11-3 run early in the fourth to get it back down to 10. Murray had seven points in a quick spam. They also got a free point from, from JaVale McGee for hanging on the rim. So shouts to JaVale for that one. Um, Jalen had a great hustle play on a kind of chase down block to stop a fast break and save two points. Bay made a big shot with about five minutes to go, get the, get the lead down, down to 10 points. They were kind of in it. Again, they were never, they were always an underdog, let's just say. Like it was down to seven at one point in the final minutes, but it was never like to the point where the Hawks were like right there. They were kind of like a step away from me right there, if that makes sense. They actually closed with a Kongwu, which I was okay with. I thought Clint was okay in this one, but the last time I did that, I kind of called it mid-game because they brought Capella back in earlier with the intent to close with a Kongwu. This time around, I think that they didn't plan to do that. I think the Hawks were making a nice run, and they stuck with the Kongwu. He actually fouled out with, with about a minute to go, but he played 16 minutes in a row before that. And Quinn kind of referenced that post-game, like, I don't think they were planning on doing that. I think they kind of were, uh, they had something going and kind of rode with it, which I'm okay with and open to for sure, but notable there. Um, they got it down, you know, 10, 9, 8, and it was 7 at one point. They kind of had to get one more stop to kind of threaten things a few times late, and they just didn't quite get over the hump. Murray had a three to go from 10 to down seven at the very end, but once they allowed a bucket there, it was essentially over. I'm not going to go through the play-by-play -play because it was not that close at the end. But the Hawks scored 38 points in the fourth quarter. Like, they were getting buckets the entire way, and I don't want to make this too simplified, but it felt like, and I, I even had it in my notes, I said it on Twitter during that run as well, the Hawks were scoring enough to make it interesting in the fourth quarter. Like, they did enough on offense after the hideous first half it was just that they, at, when they finally started to score, they had trouble stopping the Kings. And uh, not to, you know, bring this up again, but the officiating didn't help things. The Kings got to the line, I think it was like 17 times in the fourth quarter, like some crazy number. So every time the Hawks would actually kind of score, it'd be a foul or three-point play or whatever, and uh, not quite over the top. But anyway, I thought, again, one more time, it was a valiant, kind of resilient effort from the Hawks to get back into the game. It was really never over until like the last minute, minute and a half. So uh, that's kind of a, a small token of positivity. No moral victories, of course, in the NBA, but worth noting that. And uh, end result, a 15-point loss and falling to 18-25 and on the season. All right, we'll have more on the player stuff coming up in a second, as well as some trade mentions at the end of the podcast. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at Prize Picks, and Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and also the easiest, and most exciting way to play DFS. At Prize Picks, you pick two to six players, and they choose whether they actually have more or less than a projection in a ton of different categories. With 25 times the money on your entries, and you have to pick combo projections, allowing you to include two more players in different sports or different leagues. At Prize Picks, they have a huge selection of sports and stat types not offered anywhere else, and they have projections on the NFL, NBA, college football, college basketball, MLB, NHL. WNBA, and many more, and they have a Ruba policy as well at Price Picks. They are the only DFS platform with an injury insurance policy. I've enjoyed Price Picks for quite some time now, and really especially this year. I'm digging in all the time on the NBA stuff, as well as college basketball, NFL playoffs, all that, and I'll be there the entire the entire way through. The experience is really fun. It's easy as well. It's really intuitive, and I highly recommend the experience at the highest level. And the place to go, if you are interested, is prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. And use promo code LOCKEDONBA when you get there for a first-time deposit match up to $100. One more time, that is prizepicks.com slash LOCKEDONNBA. And use promo code LOCKEDONNBA when you get there 
Check out DFS Made Easy with Price Picks. All right, and to the players who appear for the Hawks in this game on a Monday evening into Tuesday, nine guys took the floor. Trent Force played the least. He actually did not score in eight minutes. 0-3 from the floor, two rebounds and an assist. I've said this before. I'm kind of a leading Trent Forrest stand, but um, it is very clear that like it's not really a good option to have Trent be your offensive engine. Like when when DJ was off the floor in this game, the offense created for the Hawks, which is not a huge surprise. It was kind of like shades of the old Trey Young era pre pre Murray when they didn't have anybody behind him. That's kind of the case here. Like Forrest, I like a lot, but he can't be your only guy, and that was the case in this one. So I think defensively he played pretty well, but offensively things were uh, ugly with Murray off the court. Patty Mills, one of five from the floor, two points, two assists. Um, he took one just <laughs> actually like genuinely horrible shot in this game. I kind of I kind of had to laugh about it. it was mid ranger, but I thought Patty was like all right. But it is kind of a reminder, and I don't want to make it too simple. But the Hawks are basically playing without Young and without Hunter. They played nine guys, and I think six and a half of them are guys that the Hawks would like to be playing in a vacuum. I think clearly the top six, which includes the Kongwu. And then I think Garrison Matthews is like a guy they're comfortable with. Like he's he's like kind of probably should be their tenth man. And right now he's their seventh man. But um, I think coming into the year, like you wouldn't necessarily be hoping to play a ton of Patty Mills and Trent Forrest. And they had to. And it's, it was they didn't, well, I guess they didn't have to, but they had to play someone in those minutes. Um, Garrison. Speaking of Garrison, he's been playing very well actually in recent days. Nine points on three threes in this one. Actually had five fouls and had a rebound, two turnovers. Um, Garrison Matthews for the season is shooting forty eight. 0.6% from three. He also, he's also taken a bunch of charges. Like he's, he's limited defensively for sure, but he gives good effort. He'll get in the way. He'll stick his nose in there. He's physical. He's a good shooter, like a proven good shooter at the, at the NBA level. And like, that's kind of why I said what I said before. I think Garrison is like a fringe rotation guy and that's okay. Um, he's making very little money as a good contract that they were able to acquire on Garrison Matthews. I think he's helped them during the stretch. Uh, Akangwu, I thought was pretty okay, uh, pretty good in a lot of different ways. Did foul a lot, as he is sometimes wont to do. Fouled out in this game in 29 minutes. Eight points, nine rebounds, three assists, two blocks for Onyeka. A bunch of like real highlight plays. Um, not quite as impactful in the first half, but was better in the second half for sure. I was okay with him closing. I thought the offense was definitely better with him um, late in the game with DeJounte and kind of like more free-flowing space and short roll stuff from DeJounte, from DeJounte and Onyeka in this one. Um, to the starters, Sadiq Bey. Uh, I, I piled on a little bit on Sadiq last night un, unintentionally, just kind of the numbers were, are what they are. He shot it a little better here. He was 0 of 12 last night. Um, sorry, not last night, The uh, in the last game on Saturday. He was 4 of 11 in this game, 2 of 7 from 3, uh, 13.7 rebounds. So I thought he was better. Um, he still shot the ball with confidence later on in the game. I gave some numbers entering tonight's game on Twitter today, and they are all really, really ugly. Like, I don't want to overstate it too much, but like, you know, corner threes have been a problem this year for Bay. He's shooting 29% coming into the game. Um, 24% on open threes, according to NBA's tracking data. And only 33% on wide open threes. So it was really rough. He was actually 2 of 7 in this game and actually improved his numbers in recent days. So still in a shooting slump, but hopefully seeing the ball go down twice will help Sadiq. I do believe that he is a better shooter than he has shown. Now, I also think that it's reasonable to believe that he's not quite the guy that he was with the Hawks last year when he shot 40%. I think his true talent level is somewhere in the mid to high 30s. It's not 25%. So he's due for some positive uh, uptick here, hopefully, and uh, we'll leave it there for now. But I thought he at least competed in this one. Defensively, though, it was rough. I mean, I don't, I don't want to always do this, but I mean, Harrison Barnes just blowing by him on repeat, especially in the first half, was uh, tough to watch in a lot of ways. Uh, Jalen Johnson. Interesting game for Jalen. He actually had a game worst, minus 24. I don't, I'm not sure that he, that he earned that. But he was not efficient in this one. He was 3 of 11 on twos and 1 of 7 from three. So 4 of 18 from the floor. Um, that is not good. But I actually was weirdly encouraged by it in that he was, I think he knew without Trey, number one, that he had to be aggressive and assertive. And I think, I think uh, especially in the future, you want that. Especially, you know, I think Jalen has star upside. Uh, that's not like definitely going to happen, but certainly is a possibility for him. And I think that him, him kind of becoming a higher usage guy would be good. He's not quite there right now, which is okay in year three, but I think it was good that he sort of took that on in this game. Some rebounds, a couple of big defensive plays in the second half. He didn't shoot it well. That's going to happen sometimes, but I, th I actually was, again, kind of encouraged by him not stopping and being aggressive and attacking the rim and looking for a shot. That was all good stuff. He just didn't make shots in this one. Uh, Capella, 11 points, 12 rebounds, two blocks for Clint in 22 minutes. He had some finishing issues in the first half. Shocking. I know. I'm kidding. But uh, I thought he was actually pretty okay. 
besides that, I think defensively he did a pretty good job in this one. Um, he dealt with Sabonis pretty well. 12 rebounds, 22 minutes is actually really good. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, the offense is not quite flow as well with Clint, which has well, been well documented even by me as a Capella defender. He is not the same kind of force offensively as a Kongu can be. And just like the, the flow is not quite as good, but I thought he actually was pretty good in this one. And uh, they were actually all right in his minutes. Um, and there was a little bit of overlap with Kongu and Capella's minutes, but they were kind of roughly the same in terms of like team quality with those guys on the floor. Bogey, 18 points, four assists. Um, just to be very fair to Sadiq Bay in particular, uh, Bogey's also not shooting the ball well at all right now. It's not quite as rough as Sadiq has been, but after that stretch where like I was yelling from the rooftops that like Bogey was clearly this expanded the year leader at that point in time, I stopped saying that because Bogey is not shooting the ball well. Um, he was okay in this one, 18 points on what 15 shooting possession because he got the, got the line six times. That's actually fine, but his jumper has not been as locked in for a couple of weeks now. So something to note there. It's not just Bay. In fact, my friend Wes Morton of Peachtree Hoops has been on this podcast before, shared some numbers before the game today about how the Hawks have been, as a team, shooting very poorly on open and wide open shots from the perimeter in the last two and a half weeks or so. That was the case again in this game. And generally speaking, this is a team that's going to have to make jump shots. They're not the most physical team going to the rim. You know, Trey gets there and gets fouled. Murray's not the best finisher. Capella, obviously, you know, free throw wise and finishing wise. Um, Jalen is going to get there for sure, but they don't have a ton of force going to the rim in general as a team. So that, that means a lot of jump shots. And, and of course, the law from Trey are helpful too. But when they're not making shots, the numbers really suffer. I think the Hawks were like 27th in the league in offensive rating for like two and a half weeks. Tonight, tonight won't help that. So like, you know, it's not a huge sample size, but they're going to have to make some shots. And that includes Bogey. That includes Bay. That even includes guys like Akongwu and Jalen and, you know, Trey, et cetera. So they all got to make shots and it is what it is. Um, and finally, a positive way to end this one. Jante was very good in this game. 35 points. That is actually his second highest point total of the season. Um, he had 41 earlier, like way early in the year, like October or November. But um, first, his high scoring game in a long, in a, in a long while. He tied a season high with six threes. He was accurate from three. He was six of 10 from three point range in this game. Only five of 13 on twos, but was certainly uh, aggressive getting to the rim. Got to the line eight times. That's actually very good for DeJounte. Uh, 10 rebounds as a, uh, I believe that was the second highest number of the year for him as well. Six assists. Um, again, he, he just played well. Like, again, DeJounte, it's never been in a situation where, like, he's not good. Like, DeJounte is very good at basketball. Um, that's a very simple way to put it. But he's also more comfortable. This is not a new phenomenon, but when he's playing point guard and when he's like the guy and has the ball in his hands, he's just in a more comfortable place. And I think that's not a shot at him. That's not a shot at Trey. It's just the reality of like this partnership or pairing that they put together a year and a half ago. DeJounte is still a point guard in terms of like his actual best role in offense is just having the ball all the time. Unfortunately, Trey's just better at that. And DeJounte has more size and all that stuff, but um, just this kind of was a reminder. It's not a new thing, but it's a reminder that like DeJounte is capable of putting up big numbers. He did it in this game. He was very good. He helped them stay in the game. Like late, especially, I think he was like, every time the Hawks got to like within 10, it was because DeJounte kind of got them there. And I thought he played very well. So, uh, you know, all the trade stuff is what it is. We'll talk about that actually right now. But I thought just independent of, it, of everything else in this game, he was very good. And if they didn't have him, they'd have been drawing dead in this one. Um, before we get out of here, not a ton of new rumor stuff trade-wise. I've kind of pledged to give some trade stuff on most podcasts between now and the deadline because there's so much going on. I spent about 10 minutes on the show over the weekend about rumors in particular, talked about a framework around a Lakers deal for DeJounte that had D'Angelo Russell and Jalen Huchifino and a 2029 first round pick and some other stuff. That made the rounds a lot today on Monday when Sean's brought it up again on his Run It Back TV show. Um, I covered it here before. It's not an offer that's going to blow you away. I totally get that. That pick is very valuable, but it is a long way out. And I know fans don't really care about that, but it's unprotected. Um, I've heard this before. I've said it on this podcast before. I share other places, but I got passed around today again. The Hawks do not want D'Angelo Russell. And it makes intuitive sense. Like, Russell's actually a pretty good player. I'm not saying he's not. But he and Trey do not fit at all together. And he's making $18 million a year. I get all that. Um, so that's that's a potential sticking point in those deals. Doesn't mean it's going to have to be a sticking point, but it could be. Uh, also, Mark Stein reported in his newsletter that, quote, it is believed that the Los Angeles Lakers to date have engaged in the most sub substantive trade discussions with Atlanta on DeJounte Murray, end quote. That's what I've been saying for a while. I think the Lakers have been the number one most likely team. It doesn't mean they're definitely going to happen or that they're number one by a lot, but they are the most prominent team so far 
in on Murray. I got some questions actually beyond like the Lakers stuff, but like kind of like if the last week changed anything with DeJounte making those big shots, et cetera. I, I would say no to whether that changed anything in terms of the Hawks thinking. Uh, also, Chris Haynes of Bleacher Report, TNT, et cetera, on a podcast with Mark Stein said the following quote, I feel pretty strongly about DeJounte Murray being moved before the deadline. That actually was recorded on Monday. So uh, that's that's after all the fireworks of the game winner. So intel-wise, it seems like there's not really much that's changed there. Whether it should have, I'll let you decide that. But um, that's kind of where we are right now. We'll see. Nothing is a lock at all right now. It seems to be more likely than not would be what I would say based on what I'm hearing that he's traded. But certainly nothing is assured in the next two, two and a half weeks. Last thing here on the trade front is that I continue to think and would report this basically that everyone on the team is still available in trade. I know I've said it before, but if you're a new listener or catching up or whatever, Trey and Jalen are not available by all accounts, um, but everybody else is. That includes DeJounte, that includes Capella, that includes Hunter, that includes Bogdanovich, that includes Sadiq Bey, that includes AJ Griffin. Um, even guys like Buffkin and Akongwu, I think are like, the Hawks don't want to trade those guys. They're not shopping Buffkin and Akongwu, but if... They got good enough offers, they would trade those guys. I think, I believe that right now. I think everyone actually is available. There are just tears to that, but just as a refresher, that's kind of where I think things are. Um, like I saw a report today, I can't remember where it was from. Somebody sent it to me about Bay being available. I'm like, yeah, Bay's obviously available. Like everybody's actually available. And again, I, I would put Kobe and Onyeka kind of in the next tier up of not unavailable, but certainly less available. But Capella, Hunter, Bogey, Bay, Griffin, and everybody else basically is very available at this point. Maybe Bogey's like a half tier above that. They don't want to trade Bogey because they like Bogey a lot, but he's obviously available with where they are right now. So if people ask me if so-and-so is available, the answer is almost always yes right now, unless it's Trey or Jalen, and that's where we'll leave it on today's podcast. All right, from here, first of all, I'm delirious, so my apologies on that. It's like 1.30 something a.m. Eastern time in Atlanta, but another late game on a Wednesday. So this is a... Very strange two-game trip to Northern California. They play one more on Wednesday in uh, San Francisco, I should say, against the Warriors. The Warriors are a bit of a mess so far this year, I have to say. Um, they are similar to the Hawks record-wise. They have, they've had some home struggles like the Hawks have had. They've also not played in a little while. Um, that's for unfortunate reasons. Of course, the assistant coach from the Warriors that passed away last week, so they actually postponed two games. They will not have played in like a week plus when the Hawks arrive. So, uh, you know, that's obviously brutal. So there's nothing really to say about that schedule wise, but like the Hawks will have, uh, they might practice on Tuesday. The Hawks might practice, but um, we will see what that looks like. I have no idea what to, to expect. Honestly, I think the Hawks will probably be underdogs in that game without Trey, but um, we'll, we'll touch on that game as we always would. I don't know about a podcast on Tuesday, TBD on that. Um, I have some stuff in the works, but I'm not sure if it'll come through, but at the very latest, I will have a podcast after the game on Wednesday. Please subscribe to this podcast. Anywhere you get your podcast, places like Apple and Spotify, as well as Overcast, all those fun places, Pocket Casts, etc. Also, we are on YouTube, so please like, rate, review, follow, subscribe, all those fun things. Tell a friend about the podcast as well. If you are a listener regularly, first of all, I really appreciate that. And second of all, if you would do me a favor, please share it with somebody or put it on social media or whatever. Find a Hawks group and share the podcast. I want to hopefully grow the show, and uh, that will be a huge help in doing so. Also, there's extra content sometimes on this podcast feed on the audio side from the folks at Lost on Sports Atlanta. I write about the Hawks on a regular basis at patreon.com slash btroll. I also share some bonus audio there sometimes when it comes to like press conferences, etc. That's a good place to find um, some more content on the Hawks. Follow the show on Twitter slash X at Locked on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter slash X at BT Roland. I really appreciate it. One more time that everybody listens to the podcast. I'm sure some of you went to bed and I don't blame you at all. It was a very late, late night. So hopefully that was a good catch up on what transpired on Monday evening. And without any further delay, I will sign off now and we'll see you at the very latest after the game on Wednesday.